Well, good afternoon and welcome to this week's Agricultural Market Situation and Outlook. Uh, we're continuing to provide this uh, series of webinars as we continue to work through the COVID situation as it's affecting the agricultural economy and the state of North Dakota. And we'll begin with Brian Parman. Yep, good afternoon, everyone. We're uh, back again for, uh, with our webinar series and uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the stuff that I've been tracking now for several weeks as the new numbers come out. Uh, I try to present them and, and digest them as best I can. So the uh, weekly unemployment numbers came out again and one bit of good news on this, I, I put a trend line to it, a moving average trend line that you can see, that's the red dotted line there. And after peaking there at the very end of March, the first week in April, the, the trend is moving downwards, which is a good sign. However, as you can see, even, even though this last week's, uh, the week ending Saturday, even though it was just shy of 3 million, that's still historically high. So while the numbers that we're adding week over week are declining, they're still from a historical perspective, very, very high. Uh, will this downward trend continue? I hope so. But the, but the thing is we've already added, you know, well over 30, 30 plus million people to the, to the unemployment payrolls in just such a very short time. And, and the bulk of it coming from just a few industries mainly that uh, uh, I think we've gotten through the backlog of folks who were unable to file claims. So we're not gonna see this sharp increase due to an influx of folks who finally got through. But to put into perspective how, how large a number this is, is just about impossible because there really isn't any historical precedent for it. And my next slide, I wanted to show <clears throat> where these, uh, just exactly how this kind of shakes out. And this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Seasonally Adjusted Unemployment. And if you look at the right hand column, that's, uh, you see, this is in thousands. So that'd be 14.283 million people have been unemployed for less than five weeks. So that's that new, that's, that's represented in that, uh, that big, those large numbers few weeks. And then the five to 14 week people, you can see that jumped from March of about one point, almost 1 1.8 million, 1.794 to seven. So the folks who had to file early got transferred into this five to 14 week. And the folks who've been in unemployed in the last month or so, they're in that 14.2 million. Now we haven't had an increase in the long term yet, but that's simply because uh, these numbers haven't been out long enough and those folks haven't been unemployed long enough to be in the long term. And that was actually doing really well leading into this. Um, <clears throat> the 15 to, six to 26 week unemployed had been stable. The 27 weeks and over had been pretty stable and actually declined in April. But I expect that those numbers as time progresses are probably going to going to grow. And you can see the average duration on the, on the right hand side, it shows the average duration of people in weeks, how long they've been unemployed, 6.1. If you go back to April 2019, which is the very far left hand column at the bottom, it's 22.8. So people short term unemployed back in April of 19, employed wound up finding jobs relatively quickly. And all of a sudden you had this big influx. So that's why that average has dropped so, uh, so dramatically. And the median duration in weeks is two. So just showing how fast and how hard this hit. So my next slide just shows something kind of interesting that I wanted to highlight on. And if you look at the very top row, all the way on the right, this is weekly earnings according to the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics. So the average weekly earnings is $1,026 per week in April. March, it was 977 bucks. So it literally went up. Now, why did it go up? That's because all of the lower income folks, which who tend to work in hospitality and food service and barbershops and these other things, they became unemployed. So their weekly earnings weren't count. So you, you can kind of glean from this, what group of workers in the U S were most heavily affected by what's going gone on with this. And it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, but these are just some numbers here that are breaking out exactly what's happening. You drop down to the bottom of this table, the last row uh, near the bottom, leisure and hospitality, average earnings went from $408 to 435. Why did they go up? Well, because the lower income folks actually dropped out of the, the average for this. 
So I want to shift gears now and go to uh, my next slide where the numbers from April came out from the BLS, uh, the consumer price index for selected things, uh, prices that consumers are paying. And I pulled exactly uh, four out of, uh, out of the numbers that came out just to highlight. So what we had here, you can see the, the purple line is ground beef and a sharp spike in ground beef in April. The kind of green colored line is eggs, a big spike in egg prices in April, going, going up from about $2 a dozen on average up to $3, so literally a 50% increase there. You have chicken that increased, chicken and poultry increased in price, and bread increased a little. It's kind of hard to see, it's that light blue line down there. It increased a little bit, but not a whole lot. So when you're thinking about consumers making budgetary choices and trying to have especially budget budget constrained consumers, folks who may have lost their job or maybe you didn't lose your job, but you're concerned about it, you're concerned about your financial well-being in the future, you might start making trade-offs uh, looking at, yes, eggs increased in price, but I showed a chart a while back, uh, quite a while ago, that showed the calories per dollar. And even if eggs go up to $3, $4 a dozen, they're still far cheaper in terms of protein and cal calories per, per dollar spent than things like beef and poultry and everything else. So some of these items from this consumer price index change. So food went up three and a half percent in the month of April, which is a record for one month since the 70s. Food at home went up 4.1% and food away from home went up 2.8% in cost. So eating out went up in cost, but not nearly as much as groceries purchased. So literally the price of groceries went up. One big area where they found that prices declined, gasoline declined by 32% in the, for the month of April. Energy in general down 17.7%, clothing down almost 6%. And interestingly, medical care was up 6% in the month of April, but that had virtually nothing to do with COVID. It's been up 5% month over month every month since about September. So I think that that's going to increase even further into the future. I just don't think the medical care portion has actually caught up to us yet, but it's something to think about that already are rising health care costs, and this certainly isn't going to make matters any better. So some retail numbers actually came out today, and they are poor to say the least. Clothing retail down 21.6% from a year ago. JC is filing for bankruptcy, if not today, if they haven't already done it this weekend. And they're closing 180 to 200 stores out of 865 and they employ about 90,000 people. That's a lot of permanently lost jobs. Pier one imports, for instance, they're closing about half their stores over half. And Macy's is closing 28 stores. Why do I bring this up in an agricultural webinar? Mainly because these are jobs. These are a lot of lost jobs that are not coming back anytime soon if these stores are permanently shuttered. And it goes directly to demand and consumer decisions at the grocery store and, the, and their food choices going forward. So this is just a few of the I guess I call them low lights of what's going on right now. Sears filed for bankruptcy back in October. And what is the long run impact on things like shopping centers, like malls? These are typically anchor stores. JCPenney is, Macy's is, Sears was. Shopping malls have been dying for a while and this is just going to accelerate something that's it's already been happening and again it speaks to jobs it speaks to incomes it speaks to consumer confidence and all these go into the decisions the budget decisions consumers are making uh, in the future uh, now I want to shift gears real quick to some articles that have come out and folks have been talking about farm bankruptcies okay Farm Bureau Bureau puts out a report on farm bankruptcies one come out somewhat recently but I want to put this into historical perspective right now. In 19, from 1920 to 29, there were almost 52,000 farms filed for bankruptcy. In 1925 was the single greatest year with almost 7,900 filing for bankruptcy. 1987 actually had 4,800 individual chapter 12 filings. And that doesn't even include 7, 11, and 13 filings, which there's no data for because the laws changed in the mid 80s and there's actually a gap in that. And the 1980s actually had a higher rate of depression because there were fewer farms. So there were fewer filings, but there were fewer farms and the relative rate was a lot higher. So my next slide shows a chart from ERS that they've 
that they put together showing banks bankruptcy rate and the number of filings. And you'll see kind of a gap there in the 1980s. You see this thin, narrower gray bar in the early 80s. And there's a gap. We know the total number of farms, but the bankruptcy rate gap because of law changes. But you look at the rate in 1987 was the worst that we actually have data for. And it was, it was pretty pretty terrible. Uh, and, and the number of farms have kind of stabilized since the, since the early 90s. Now, here's what the rates are. My next slide shows a map of the, rate, of the number of filings and where they've kind of been located. 627. Okay, so yes, there's been an increase in bankruptcies. Yes, it's a 23% increase. But we have to remember we were starting from a really low number. When we're thinking about almost 5,000 filings in 1987 versus 627 in you know, the last year relative to the number of farms, that's still pretty low. And we've, we've been coming through some fairly tough times, I would say, uh, having been covering this and talking about it the last half decade. Uh, things haven't been easy and still the bankruptcies haven't, there hasn't been a lot of uh, a rush to, to file for bankruptcy that hasn't had to happen yet. And that's a good thing. Now, what this year is going to look like, uh, 2020 headed into 2021, I would expect that we're going to see an increase in filings a, a, again. I don't know that the rate's going to be tremendous. I know there's some programs, some ad hoc programs that are, prob that are coming out. Uh, we, we don't have all the details on yet that it's going to provide some farm relief and probably going to mitigate a lot of this. I expect that this number will go up more than 627. And the other thing is a lot of these, you see this Midwest, it's in the middle that's red. A lot of them have been dairies. Uh, the dairy sector has been hit hard for the last several years. And a lot of those bankruptcies in that area are dairies. Uh, North Dakota gets lumped into that group, but Minnesota and Wisconsin are making up the bulk of it. So right now, bankruptcies, I would say, have not been a a, a big problem or, or it, it's showing they're, they're starting to rear their head a little bit, but I wouldn't say that they've, you know, skyrocketed. It's kind of one of those deals where if you start from a really no, low number and then you double it, yeah, it went up 100%, but you're still at a really no, low number. And that's kind of where we are from a historical perspective. So not looking terribly bleak from that aspect but again this is a whole new year with a whole new set of problems and we'll uh we'll be monitoring it and letting you guys know going forward what what, what that's kind of looking like uh, and how that's going to shake out so with that i'd like to go ahead and turn it over to frayne olson thank you all right good afternoon everybody uh my name is frayne olson i'm a crop economist and marketing specialist with ndsu extension um this this week, I thought I'd provide a little bit of a, an update and provide some context for the current status of the U.S.-China Phase One trade agreement. So, on my first slide, I just wanted to provide some kind of quotes that have been showing up in the news uh, basically this morning. Um, there were some statements made by President Trump overnight that have the markets a bit concerned. Uh, the political tensions between the United States are up again. And, and obviously the grain markets as well as the equity markets pay a lot of attention to these statements. Um, so we need to be following them. And I'll, I'll make some additional comments later on. Uh, right now, personally, you know, I, I want to try and stay out of this political debate or political arena. Um, this is a rapidly changing and, and again, the winds of the political uh, arena change so quickly that, that I'm, I really don't want to make a lot of comments on that, but um, there are some people, some individuals that I'm following pretty closely to try and get a, a, a more ground level view of where we stand and what, what might be happening when it comes to the actual implementation. So here's just a few quotes. I want to read them overnight uh, on, on one of the major networks and he made these comments. Uh, so I make a great trade deal and now I say these, uh, these, this doesn't feel the way the same to me. The ink is barely dry and the plague came over and it doesn't feel the same to me. And in the following on later on in that same kind of interview, uh, there are many things we can do. We can do, we could do things. We could cut off the whole relationship. And obviously statements like that really cause some concern in, in the marketplace. On my next slide, um, there's some additional things. Uh, later on, uh, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin was interviewed regarding President Trump's comments. Uh, and and his, his phrasing was the president's is concerned. He's reviewing all his options. 
Obviously, we were very concerned about the impact of the virus on our economy, on US jobs, the health of the American public, and the president's going to do everything to protect the economy and protect the American workers. So again, some of the administration now is starting to take a little bit softer tone. Um, this morning, actually, just after I, I, I prepared all this stuff, uh, White House advisors um, Larry Kudlow came out and made a statement that with, with respect to the U.S.-China trade agreement, that absolutely uh, it's absolutely not falling apart, and the two countries are still working on trade. So um, it's just leveling this, this level of tensions is starting to rise, and it's causing some concerns about the longevity and at least the the structure of of the current um, current trade agreement phase one agreement. So on my next slide, I want to zero in a little bit on what we do know. Um, the the trade phase one agreement has many chapters to it, has many sections to it. There's two of them that really have the greatest impact on agriculture, uh, which is chapter three, which talks specifically about trade and agriculture. Um, and that the goal of those those sec that section or those sub chapters really deals with the these um, non tariff barrier trade issues like biotechnology, the sanitary phytosanitary regulations, food safety issues. So these are the procedural things that go on in trade between country A and country B to make sure that the product flow is as smooth as possible. Um, the other one that a lot of a lot of people are really focused on right now is the chapter six, which is the expanding trade section. And that's the part that I really want to focus on um, this afternoon. So on my next slide, I actually have a quote out of the um, that chapter six, article 6.2. Um, and this is the one that often, again, gets quoted in the press. And I'll read that just a couple comments here. So for the category of agricultural goods identified in Annex 6.1 or Appendix 6.1, no less than $12.5 billion above the corresponding 2017 baseline will be imported by China in calendar year 2020. So we have this 2017 baseline, and I'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. And what the agreement says is that China will purchase an additional $12.5 billion in calendar year 2020. And then when we move into calendar year 2021, China has agreed to purchase an additional $19.5 billion above that 2017 baseline. So, you know, the question comes, well, what's the baseline number? And on the next slide, um, USDA in their analysis of the, the, this phase one agreement, because USDA is in charge of tracking all of this, as well as working on some implementation issues with respect to agriculture, their quote out of one of their analysis uh, sheets or mountain analysis publications in February said the agreement does not identify the 2017 baseline amount. So in the, in the base agreement, we don't know what the 2017 baseline amount is. I think we can make an educated guess on what it is, but we don't know specifically because it's not in the, in the exact agreement. What it does say is the United States and China will use official Chinese and U.S. trade data to determine whether the purchase commitments by China have been met. So the U.S. is going to track the dollars sold. Uh, the Chinese are going to tr track the dollars purchased. We're going to try and reconcile those to make sure that we're both counting the same numbers. So on the next slide, um, again, I wanted to provide a, a, a more of a, a context or an update. So if we can move to the next slide. There we go. Late last week, uh, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer, as well as uh, Treasury, Secretary, Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin, and the Vice Premier of China, Liu He, uh, had a conference call. And this is the first time that these three individuals, which are really the key leaders for negotiating this phase one agreement, actually got together and touched base again. So it had been several months since these key, um, again, negotiators had actually had a chance to visit and say, how are we doing? You know, how are we progressing? Are we making progress? And, and how do things look? And out of that conference, after that conference call, uh, Lighthizer and Mnuchin made a joint statement and just a couple of quotes out of that, that, that segment. Uh, both sides agreed that good progress is being made on, on creating the government infrastructures necessary to make the agreement a success. And really that's referring to, um, for example, that, that chapter three discussing specifically agricultural issues, that we're working out these differences in our procedures and processes to make sure that we're, we're using the same information. 
So again, trying to remove those non-tariff barriers to trade. On the next slide, they did make some comments specifically about um, this uh, level of purchases, which is that chapter six portion. So they also agreed that in spite of the current global health emergency, both countries fully expect to meet their obligations under the agreement in a timely manner. Now that was the statement coming out of the United States side. Uh, there's a very similar language, similar statements coming out of the Chinese side. So as, as I try and evaluate and figure out what's going on, are, are, are some of this, uh, some of the, the political rhetoric, is that really gonna translate into substantial is issues for this trade agreement or the phase one agreement? I tend to lean towards listening to Robert Lighthizer very carefully. Um, it, historically, he's tried to, he's very careful what he says, but he's tried to provide a very even handed analysis or assessment of where we sit within not only the negotiation process, but also now this implementation portion. So we're getting um, multiple signals here. And, and again, the markets are gonna be very sensitive to these, whatever statements are made saying, well, what is the probability that this phase one agreement is actually gonna be implemented and the Chinese are actually gonna live up to the expectations we have about their purchases. So on the next slide, there's some comments made from the Chinese side of the ledger. So these are statements that were made just recently in the, next, in the last day or so. Um, one of them is from uh, the chief analyst within uh, the Shanghai JC in, in, uh, Intelligence or JCI. Um, this is a private uh, con consulting firm in China. It's, it's very well respected within the, in the global community for having pretty accurate information about what's happening within the Chinese um, um, agricultural sector. Um, they provide their analysis and forecasts for what they believe is gonna happen. Very similar to US companies that do the same thing on, on the United States side. So the head of this chief analyst was made the comment that China has the ability to complete the $40 billion purchases, which again is refer referring to these additional purchases that China has agreed to make. Uh, but such purchases have to be based on friendly atmosphere. So again, this is signaling that, you know, if, if we don't have, uh, if the trade relation between the United States and China becomes strained, that that brings into question the levels of, of purchases that China is going to make. And again, this is what the, the marketplace is responding to. The other thing, uh, China will still implement the trade deal and chances are, are high that China will speed up purchases. Now, this is something that again, put a little bit of a positive lift into the market. It was made yesterday. Um, this is from the vice general manager of Kafko International. Kafko is the is a very large um, purchasing arm for the U.S. for the Chinese government. Okay, so what they do is is owned firm. They do a lot of grain trading as well as grain pro. Very very large buyer in the in the international markets. Um, own tremendous assets globally. And so the statement that they said, yes, we're still planning to implement the trade deal and that they're gonna be speeding up purchases soon. Again, put a positive tone back in the marketplace. The next slide, let's just look at some of the specific numbers. And this is information that I have prepared. So I wanna, I, this is not official USDA information. This is not official, uh, official numbers prepared by the, by the US government. This is stuff that I have collected. And I just want to explain it very quickly. What I did was I searched, uh, I did a custom query or custom download from the US Census Bureau. US Census Bureau is in charge of tracking all the imports and exports of, of goods and services uh, from the United States. Okay, and USDA uses this Census Bureau data as they're cross-referencing and checking the information about trade and trade flows. So this is kind of considered the the main, the gold standard, if you will, the main data source for, for tracking the dollar volumes and quantities of trade for a, a, a bunch of agricultural as well as other, other U.S. products. So what I did, there's uh, 217 specific codes or, or, or line items that are identified directly in that appendix. Remember I mentioned this, that there was an appendix at the very end. There's about seven pages of agricultural items that we're going to follow and track to say, has China um, purchased the additional agricultural products that they had promised to in the actual agreement? So again, these 217 agricultural products are listed directly in the phase one agreement. So what I did is identified all 217 of those and I ran a custom query. 
Now, unfortunately, if you notice in the little footnote at the very bottom, there were three items that I wasn't able to find. Of the 217, there's three of the codes I couldn't track down to get exact dollar amounts, and they were essential oils, uh, finishing agents, and uh, dye carriers. So I'm, I'm guessing that those are relatively small. So these numbers should be very representative of the trade flows that we're looking at as it relates to this phase one agreement. Now, again, as we said before, critical year. So 2017 is our reference point. What China has agreed to do, at least for the calendar year 2020, is to increase their purchases by $12.5 billion. Well, based on those 217 uh, items, the tally that I came up with it was about $20.9 billion in 2017. So we're using, trying to do an apples to apples comparison here. So the 20.927, that's in billions of dollars. And again, in the trade agreement, we're counting dollars. We're not, count, we're not counting bushels or tons. I also then broke down, well, within all of those 217 categories or 217 items, which are the biggest categories? What are the big, biggest sections that China has historically purchased from us? And if you look at the column for soybeans, um, in 2017, in the red there, they, they purchased $12.2 billion worth of U.S. soybeans. Percent of the total purchases in 2017. The second largest category is what's called cereals, and that included um, wheat, corn, sorghum, um, some of the uh, finished products in there like flour or partially, product, pro partially processed products. And then the third largest category was uh, fish and crustaceans. The, by far the largest was the soybean category. Okay, now if we drop down to the blue line, the blue row, excuse me, the, the only information we have from January through the end of March. So again, this database is updated periodically. We don't have uh, information or totals through today's date. This is information collected from January through March. And if we look at the numbers for January, current purchases in dollar terms is about $3 billion, well below kind of any kind of target values that we need. And again, when we look at soybeans, approximately a third, about $1 billion of the, of the purchases were made from the soybean category. Now, earlier on, we talked of the, uh, it was the head of Kafka, vice, vice uh, chairman of Kafka, mentioned that, that their purchases were going to be accelerating soon. So on the next slide, just to reemphasize that, the purchases that China makes from the United States are very seasonal. I, I, I have the same graphic now for corn, soybeans, and wheat. Um, we'll start with soybeans. And what this is, is it's, it's tracking bushels or tax we keep switching back and forth. But I got this information from USDA. We get weekly updates on what the amount that China has purchased from the United States. These again are our purchase agreements. So it's not that this is actual shipments. These are the, the, the amount of product that they have under contract for delivery within the marketing year. Okay, now the other thing that gets a little bit goofy is we in agriculture, look, our USDA, when they track this, usually track it on a marketing year basis because they were looking at the supply demand conditions. Well, for this trade agreement, we're looking at the calendar year. So we have to kind of divide the calendar year from the marketing year. And that's why I put that black um, vertical line in to try and represent the January one time period. So if we, this is a, a graphic showing weekly export sales to China for soybeans, but it's the cumulative uh, purchases. So every time we make a sale of soybeans to China, we add it to the pile of sales. So what we'd like to see is this pile of sales, accumulated sales grow as quickly as possible over time. And obviously something like the green line, which is 2016-17, before the trade agreement, before the trade war began, is, is the kind of, of sales volume we'd like to see. The red line is current sales through um, uh, May 7th. So again, there's always kind of a lag. We had some additional um, soybean purchases of, by China this week. We also had, they came in and bought some US corn. They're not reflected in these numbers. So when we look at this, if you compare the red line to kind of the historical numbers that we see 
before the trade war began, were at much, much lower levels than, than we've seen prior to that. And again, the black line representing last year's purchases. So up to today's date, China has purchased about the same volume of soybeans they did in last marketing year, but the timing was a little bit different. The reason I wanna point this out is if you look at when does China typically buy large quantities of US grains? And it happens just as we start begin US harvest. So again, harvest for soybeans typically is late September, first part of October. And as you can see, when we enter our harvest period, our sales volume to China increases very, very rapidly. And I suspect that's gonna happen again this year. And again, that's one of the things that the, the vice, uh, vice chairman of, of COFCO was, was noting is that we expect to have purchases start increasing fairly rapidly later on in the year. So again, I want to, when we think about the timing issues, I'm looking for increased purchases, more, more large substantial purchases from the United States as we start our um, harvest. If you go to the next slide, this is the same thing for corn. Now I did make one small change. That small change is that I added the gold line, which is 2013-14. So the, when we look at the previous slide versus this one, I added one additional year. I did that on purpose because obviously 2013-14 was very different than what we've seen from 2014 through the current time period. And the reason for that is, is our MIR-162 or the Syngenta trait that was genetic trait that was not approved by the, the Chinese and they basically stopped buying large quantities of US corn. So previous to that, prior to that um, trade dispute, prior to that problem we had with genetic and registration of genetic materials, China was a pretty large buyer of US corn. And they may return to be one again if we can get some of these uh, sanitary, fine sanitary issues worked out, these non tariff trade barriers. But again, let's look at the seasonality. When do the Chinese purchases really start to begin and take off? Well, they tend to come in and buy larger quantities of US corn historically, again, about the time that our, our marketing year starts, at a, you know, in that late September, first part of October time period. So if we compare the red line, which is where we are today, to the potential, if they were to come back and purchase U.S. corn like they have in the past, you know, that's a very, very large and substantial difference. I'm not saying or trying to imply that that's what's going to happen, but it's just historically, that is what has typically happened. And we tend to see, again, these big purchases right around the harvest time period. And my last slide um, is, is basically the same thing for wheat. Now this is all wheat. It's not just spring wheat or winter wheat. This is all US wheat. And you'll notice that we have a very, very similar trend. Um, if we compare the red line, this is where we are today versus that gold line on top, which was again before a lot of, a lot of the trade disputes and trade tensions between the United States and China began. You see that a lot of our purchases, a lot of those those large buys that China comes in and makes tends to be at the end of, or very beginning of our harvest season, the end of the growing season, beginning of the harvest season. So again, I, I think we're, there are several things coming together that if we can keep pushing forward with this trade agreement that we will start to see larger purchases uh, by China of US agricultural bulk, bulk commodities per, primarily. So with that, I'll hand things over to Tim. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. We go to my first slide. I am going to make some introductory comments, not on the slide, but uh, everybody wondering about CFAP and when are we going to know about our payments again? Uh, nothing this week, and and uh, we'll have to wait another week or more. USDA, FSA, AMS did hold a, a webinar yesterday to and it turns out, I think some people at least were disappointed in that they basically just covered some of the forms they use that for people that aren't used to working with FSA. And so we didn't get a lot of new information there. I have heard by the grapevine that uh, a week from today, there's going to be some training for company and state staff on it. So I know they're making progress out there, but we just have to wait. All kinds of things going in and wash, uh, around Washington that, that could affect the livestock and the entire egg industry. You know, the House right now is debating a $3 trillion HEROES Act, they call it, with all kinds of stuff for egg. Uh, you know, there, there's a Senate bill to require 50% negotiated fed cattle or requests for 
uh, euthanasia funds for the pork industry, possibly, you know, request open CRP to keep cattle on grass longer than feedlots, a proposal to pay feedlots to, to delay fed steers that are ready to go and on and on and on. So uh, just a lot going on there. It's all debate why, and we're gonna continue to hear these things uh, because of the unprecedented times we have. On my uh, first slide here, I'm just showing how dramatically production of beef pork in particular and, and broilers, another big one we look at, I have lamb there, how dramatic change we had in the month of April. You've heard me say before that we were expecting record uh, production of beef, pork, chicken, and total meat. And uh, that was on track there into March, you can see it at record high levels. And then with the packing plant closures and slowdowns and the labor issues and so on, we just had a dramatic decline in both beef and pork production. Down on the lower right hand side, broiler production also was off, but it kind of came back. The chicken plants aren't having as many problems as the beef and pork because there isn't as close a contact and more mechanized and so on, although they did come off. This kind of goes right into Brian's comments about hamburger prices going up. It's a good reason why hamburger prices have went up because look at how beef production and so our supplies are much lower and on the other hand like he mentioned the demand is higher because of all the uh, switch over to grocery store buying and and uh, and lower price things and and all those issues the, the panic filling up so we had a big increase in demand for hamburger, a big decline in production, and those two things obviously both spark higher prices. So if we go to the next slide, uh, just leading into what I've been talking about here, I'll go back one there. Uh, Every month, the uh, USDA Office of Chief Economist puts out the WASD report, we call it, and Frayne talks a lot about it too on the grain side. On the livestock side, usually there are very few changes once they start a, a new year, and, uh, and, uh, but it does come out every month. And this whole, a much bigger version of this is on my website if you want to go to it. I even go all the way back to 2014 up through the the, the current and show you all the things. But here all I did is pull last month's April 9th report out compared to the new report that came out this week on May 12th, just to show you that, you know, uh, I was on a conference call with the USDA people that make these forecasts and, you know, they're like everybody else pulling their hair out of things are happening so fast. How can we, how can we make adjustments and all the uncertainty and so on. But, you know, every highlighted number there on the April, uh, back one month ago was, was record. We, USDA was predicting record beef production, pork production, broiler production, and total meat production. And you see then on the bottom is prices for fed steers and fed hogs, uh, much bigger production. So we were expecting, they were expecting prices to be down a little bit. Go to the one month later, this, this came out this week, one month later, USDA is saying instead of record production of beef up about 1% from last year, uh, last year we did, or last, uh, yeah, last year in 2019, we did 27.15. So uh, this, that, you know, that was a record and they were predicting a record for 2020. Now jumped to May 12th, what came out, lowered it over 5% on beef production down to 25.76, lowered pork production, lowered broiler production, lowered uh, total meat production at not a record. And uh, even though production is down, which you might think would enhance prices because of all the pandemonium and so on, uh, prices down as well. Actually, USDA started out this year saying fed steers would be 120 this year. That compares to a 117 price, average price in 2019. So they're predicting higher fed cattle prices. And then as we had the high production and started running into some COVID problems that dropped last month to 111 and further reduced it down to uh, uh, 104 in this report. So just Never before in one month has USDA uh, changed this uh, so much. And so that's how rapidly things happen and uh, just very much a sign of the time. So go to the next slide. And 
Uh, I've been showing this for a couple of weeks. We still are selling. This is the our market report hot off the press this morning for three auctions that USDA uh, keeps track of now in North Dakota. That's Dickinson and Mandan and Napoleon. Uh, you see we did uh, over 6,300 cattle uh, this week at auction, so they're still open and we're moving a, a good volume of cattle uh, to the right of that. You see last year, they didn't report the markets because there wasn't enough for the prices. I'm not gonna go through all those, but you, prices were up about uh, one to two dollars. You see the prices there I've outlined on the top, still a good demand for grass calves, uh, the lighter weight calves, although as you see on the way on the far left, we aren't selling very many because we don't have uh, many fall born calves that would weigh that. So, you know, lower supply and good demand there. Move on up into the heavier weights. And again, now we're getting more up into the 800 and 900s, but we're following that 750 to eight weight there. 132.83 up about a dollar fifty to two dollars this week at those markets. So the good news is the market isn't falling. The good news is that you know that we're still merchandising on the fed cattle side and you know lambs the hogs same way. They're tough to get a bid up here, but uh, on the feeder cattle side we are still merchandising and, and uh, the prices aren't plummeting at the same time. So go to the next slide. Uh, is just the slide again that I've been showing every week that uh, the red line is what these 750s, the eight weights have done all year. And then the red squares are the futures market. And so again, we're trading well above the May futures that uh, today are about 124.50. And uh, actually the May feeder cattle contract closes a week early, closes next Thursday because of it's a holiday week. And, and so, you know, there's another signal that we are selling above what they are in, in other places and, and, and kind of a signal that if you've got cattle, I, I guess maybe to keep trading them. So go to the next slide, uh, just to, uh, I haven't really talked about heifers and uh, you know, there's still, some optimism out there in the country. This, you know, heifers generally sell under steers for sure, but you know, have a pretty good run of heifers this week. Actually, 53% of the entire run was heifers, and uh, and uh, and replacement heifers. A lot of cases bringing the same price as steers. So if you're selling, uh, you know, and you know, get bangs vaccinated heifers and good quality and so on, or as you can see there, they're bringing a thousand dollars, you know, in, in spite of all the turmoil we have there. So the next slide I actually showed you last time is just all these uh, webinar series that we've, we're holding and we've held uh, several. Uh, last night talked about a, an in-depth perspective of Packer profits and on Tuesday we did uh, uh, in depth on MCOOL and imports and exports. They're continuing again next week with talk about of euthanization and an in depth perspective of local meats that there's a lot of interest in now since of the packing plan and on down. So uh, just help yourself to those webinars if you like. And uh, that's about all for me now. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave to talk about energy. Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Dave Ripplinger, Bioproducts, Bioenergy Economic Specialist with NDC Extension. Uh, ending with some really good news as far as what's going on in the transportation fuel sector. Uh, we're seeing uh, gasoline use uh, grow steadily off the bottom it had a few weeks ago. Uh, and with that, we're seeing uh, that, that same uh, increased use for the most part in ethanol. So the first two charts uh, kind of show that. First is the gasoline, which is on the upper left-hand side, and then ethanol use essentially or input to, to refineries on, on the upper right hand side. Different scales on, e on each axis but you see that they move really closely together and this is kind of uh, also repeated or, or shown a different way by just considering that blend rate. Again with most ethylene in the United States sold as a blend as E10 uh, with gasoline. Kind of watch that a little bit closely to see how that'll hold up um, and right now we are seeing that there is a little bit of a break and we're down at that, that 0.09 or that 9% blend rate. And um, the question might be a little bit, uh, is, is that gonna continue if we, we don't see uh, 
regular gasoline sell as much as possible as, as premium other blends. Uh, kind of going along with that too, just looking at, at production, which is, is picking up, but not actually as fast as uses or that ethanol input number. And um, so we've seen a nice uh, steady decline in, in stocks, which is leading to a relatively strong increase in, in ethanol prices. And then if we look at the, the South Dakota ethanol prices, again, we don't have North Dakota ethanol rep prices reported by USDA. Uh, the, the simple crush uh, on, on a bushel basis for the South Dakota, the South Dakota ethanol refiner is now $1.25 a, a bushel, which is uh, a good enough number to definitely encourage others to, to enter the market. Uh, if you kind of look and compare those prices, we actually see the corn, uh, the corn prices that these ethanol refiners have been paying for is still about the same. Uh, and we expect it now that, you know, use is picking up that they might be able to, to pay a little bit more to, to draw more corn to the refineries. Uh, but of course the biggest change on the positive side is the increase in ethanol prices. And, and these are the spot prices that those ethanol refineries reported receiving up almost 50% off the bottom uh, in early April. So that's, you know, definitely good news. And again, the, the signal that, uh, that, that that market is really starting to take off that, you know, more and more refineries will be coming online in the next few weeks. Uh, furthermore, you know, we're seeing that a, a, a decline in, in distillers grains prices, partially because corn is a little bit weaker, they have to compete. And also because we're seeing additional supply uh, come back. Probably most importantly, kind of looking at uh, the, the general the general trend this time of year is we're entering the driving season. Memorial Day is uh, coming up soon. Uh, and typically, we see much more passenger travel in that time. And so we would expect naturally that we'd have this increase in use. And then, of course, much of the, the increase in gasoline and ethanol use is really coming just from the, the, the opening up of the economy. Uh, some folks haven't didn't uh, refill their vehicles for, for six or eight weeks. Uh, now they're getting to the point where at least they're refilling and a lot of folks are driving or returning to some of their, their regular uh, travel behavior. Uh, looking now at crude oil more broadly, uh, things are, are looking much better for crude generally, uh, although uh, there's still, still a lot of challenges here. Uh, we've seen an increase in stocks, even though though input and use uh, is 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 still kind of going the right way that we're 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 starting to to get that balance on the gasoline side and we'll see that balance in in the refining side, uh, but we're still not seeing the, the reduction necessarily, or at least it's not reflected in these numbers in the reduction in in domestic oil production. Uh, there's a lot of concern in the trade that you know that these numbers are off uh, substantially on the production side and that they're really not indicative of what's happening in terms of shut-in wells. Uh, primarily in Texas and here in North Dakota. Uh, we can see that this, some things reflected in the, the price of uh, WTI futures, the nearby futures contract is nearly double what it was uh, a week ago, uh, now almost $30, which is, is definitely a nice sign. The, the unfortunate thing is there's t been recently about a 10 to $12 spread between WTI futures and the North Dakota light sweet, which is our predominant uh, oil, uh, that used to be, you know, ten to twelve dollars, and now we're over twenty dollars. And and really, there's this 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 break in the market, or this break in these traditional price relationships. As again, there's still this signal for a lot of lot of uh, folks to slow down uh, production, or even, you know, in this case, maybe even shut in uh, some production. And again, it ends up being that 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 regional type market, which are driving things, as opposed to what we typically see, which are these pretty strong price relationships. Uh, in, in, in different uh, types of oil across the country. Uh, other good news too is we've, we did see that Cushing stocks have, have, have actually fallen. Uh, we've been following this pretty closely and, and this is a really good sign. We're, it was still at, at, very high, at a very high percent of use, uh, but definitely going in the right direction. You know, as gasoline use picks up with the, with the, the summer driving season, uh, things are looking a little bit more optimistic. Of course, we'll have to see exactly how that this plays out. And again, with all of this, this EIA data, it, it is a week old. And so it, it doesn't necessarily tell us what's going on today. A uh, couple of other things, just, just really high level. First of all, following the, WAS, the WASD report, which came out this week, uh, they did revise their, their, their corn use for ethanol downward uh, only slightly. Uh, I think numbers is still a little bit high. Uh, it would really 
uh, assume that we're going to go back to, to nearly uh, full production, regular use of corn ethanol domestically, which is uh, quite optimistic. Again, thinking just about that, that calendar, that, excuse me, that marketing year for corn, which we've only got 18 weeks left in. Uh, the other thing to look at too, and, and it would drive some of these other studies, if we look at DOE's numbers, uh, they, they released their monthly short-term energy outlook this week, and they're still uh, quite optimistic in terms of the recovery of the entire fuel complex uh, throughout 2020 and then in, further into 2021. Uh, so if you look at those, those numbers for crude production, only a slight reduction in, in, in crude production. Um, and that, that, that annual number for 2020 is higher than what it was last week. And so that would mean that we're, you know, we'd be looking at things uh, becoming pretty, pretty firm, at least where they are, maybe even increasing. Uh, crude input following a, falling a bit. Uh, again, this is, is much higher than where we've been the last few weeks. So again, it would require the, the market to, to, to strengthen even further. Uh, ethanol production down only slightly, ethanol use, down a bit more than that, and gasoline use down a bit. And again, the, the general message from, from that report is that, you know, DOE was a really real, well-received, uh, pretty fair arbiter and, and, and determine, determine of, of these types of outlooks. You know, they're, they're pretty confident in uh, that, 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 that strengthening of the, the market, you know, going forward. Uh, just a couple of notes quick on the policy side of things. Uh, probably the biggest thing going on in, in ethanol in terms of policy is there's a lot of discussion uh, uh, in Washington determining of what they might do with the RFS. Again, the Renewable Fuel Standard mandates biofuel use by type and year. Uh, the petroleum industry really would like to see a waiver of at least some of or a reduction in that, that level for this year. Uh, as, as we're going to see lower gasoline use, lower uh, distillate fuel use, um, we'll see how that goes. It is an election year. It'll you know, be interesting to see how that, that all weighs out. Uh, Tim mentioned earlier the HEROES Act, which is a, 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 a bill in the House, uh, which has a number of different provisions on the biofuel side. It does include a 45 cent a gallon uh, 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 incentive for folks or, or a, a payment for, for those who actually produce biodiesel for the first four months of the year. Uh, and if folks didn't happen to do that, they'd get, if, if they happened to stop production at lower production, they'd get 50% uh, of, of that difference. So instead of every gallon produced, it would be half of what they didn't produce times that 45 cents. Not really sure where this is going to go. There's a lot in that HEROES Act, which uh, was likely not palatable uh, in the Senate or uh, in the White House. But again, it's out there for discussion and it gives kind of a barometer of, of what at least a, a large portion uh, of the elected officials in Washington are thinking. Uh, finally, too, we're seeing the, the, the rollout of the Higher Blend Infrastructure Investment Program from USDA. Uh, it's it been a long time in the works and essentially the rules are out and I actually got an email just before our meeting today uh, with the application available. So this is uh, funds that are available from USDA to help essentially put in blender pumps. And we've, you know, sitting in North Dakota, we've actually have uh, still the, the largest number of blender pumps uh, per capita, per vehicle mile traveled by a large amount, uh, due in large part be because of, of state programs and act actions by North Dakota Corn uh, to help support that. And here we have USDA coming back in uh, to, to, to make those types of choices available uh, for, at the consumer level. And again, the, the, the application is out today. So if anyone's interested, uh, you know, it, it's there for the taking. And, and typically these types of programs are first come, first serve. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to question and answer, uh, giving you just a little bit of time as we kind of move forward. I'd just let you know if, if you would uh, give us some feedback using the URL on the screen to be greatly appreciated. I know many of you have been, you know, regular attendees of this, and that's fantastic. Uh, and you, many of you have provided feedback, but we, we, additional feedback or timely feedback is appreciated. So if you have new thoughts, especially about topics you think we should cover, please let us know. Uh, and then as always, we do uh, post a recording of, of this webinar as well as a PDF of the presentations online at the two sites uh, on your screen. And so with that, I'm gonna give you a, a few seconds to ask some questions. Uh, and then I also ask our specialists if there's anything uh, that, that came to mind as they were hearing others speak about different topics. 
And as apparently we did a fantastic job covering our material today. Uh, we uh, do have one, one, we do have one question that came in. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is about the impact of, of Canadian shale oil on North Dakota uh, oil. You know, they're really different products. Uh, the, the, the Canadian oil is, is much heavier. Uh, it has a little bit further to go. And, and again, if you think that, that oil is not a commodity, it's not like number two corn. Uh, so if the density is considerably different, which would be the difference between a light and a heavy, you know, it's going to go to a different refinery. And because it's heavier, it's going to take additional processing. And so they're really, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're related products, but not the same. And we actually saw this earlier. Canadian uh, tar sand oil was really getting pushed a much greater pushback than than, uh, than North Dakota Light Sweet, you know, earlier and, and, and harder again, because it has to go find that refinery that uh, is looking for heavy and then, you know, would have to, you know, adjust for the, the transportation differences as they matter. Again, it's really important to, to think too, uh, you know, logistically or look at the, that at the map and realize, you know, most of our refining capacity is in the Gulf, uh, you know, to get it there, to get it to the right refinery and then to get it out to the customer, you know, it, it changes things quite a bit. And that's why you're seeing uh, a bit of a preference for that WTI because it's, you know, it's right there. They can deal with it. And really these strong signals for the somewhat more distant or in the case of the heavy, somewhat less desirable oils, you know, not to be produced. Uh, Dave, uh, uh, there was a, a chat. Uh, what's the implication of the states declaring oil production a waste? I thought maybe Oklahoma was considering this. That's a great question. I don't even understand the context of that. Um, I, don't know, I don't know, Claire, if you have any additional information. Oh, and then, Frank, if you want to give us your, 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 your price predictions, uh, they're waiting for those. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, I'll, we're out I'll, of time, huh, Frank? <laughs> yeah, it's about time, right? <laughs> uh, I, I, will, uh, I, will, I will see if I can put something together for next week. <laughs> How does that sound? Yeah, and, and then here's a question for Tim. Uh, regarding calves, only worth $360 ahead this fall. Um, do you think that's a possibility? Well, anything's a possibility, even now, uh, you know, hopefully we can recover. I, I didn't really mention that, but slaughter is coming back and uh, it's a long way till fall and uh, many things can happen. And, you know, Congress is trying to do things. So uh, I, uh, it's a possibility, I would say right now, that, well, it depends on the weight and so on. You see what they're selling for now. And, and we're, you know, in the height of the pandemic, but we'll have a lot more you know, more calves to sell this fall, although a lower calf crop. So, you know, as of now, I would take them down uh, as a rule 10 to 15% what they were last year, which would, uh, you know, is not not good at all, but, and, and then wait and see. That's my idea now. Right. Thanks, they Tim. could be all over the board. Yeah, and, and so here, here's the same question, but just asked differently, Frayne. So what corner soybean prices do you think producers uh, should be prepared to sell at in the next three to four months? Oh, boy, nothing like being put on the spot here, right? <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just going to look at, a, at, at the December futures chart. And um, one, of the, one of the first break points, I guess one of the first pricing targets that I'd really start looking at, I know it seems a little bit out of the range right now, but I, I think we can, we can move higher. Uh, the, there's a, 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 from a charting standpoint, there's a break at about, for December corn at about 355. I think that would be one of the places, but I know that's gonna be a little bit lower than a lot of folks want. Um, the, my my real kind of key target point for December corn is 370 on on December futures. Um, I if I, I think we can get back into that range, but anything above that is going to be really really difficult to do. Again, in particular given the rapid planting progress that we've got in the corn belt for, for that's going on right now, um, and and some of the concerns and issues about the the ethanol markets on November soybeans. Um, the, the, I think the first, I guess, real test of the marketplace is going to be at about 890 on, on November soybeans. Um, can we get through that? I think we could get later on in the season. 
uh, especially if, if China does come in and make some larger purchases. I think the real sticky point, the real tough number for uh, November be beans is going to be about a 925. It's going to be very difficult. We could probably get back up into those levels, but it's going to be really, really difficult to punch through those unless we have some major, major um, changes in the marketplace and the attitude that's going on right now. Thanks, Rain. Yeah, and Claire gave a little bit more uh, background on that, a story from Oklahoma about whether you consider oil production a waste uh, and, and, and as, as a reason or to actually force producers to stop pumping. Again, I, you know, I haven't heard about this. I do know uh, in Texas, the Texas Rail Commission uh, is, it oversees the, the Texas oil industry. And piece of trivia for you is that OPEC is actually based off of the, the Texas Rail Commission and that they do in Texas uh, have the ability to uh, in, enforce essentially, you know, different levels of production. The government will, will go in and and try and convince folks not to produce. And one of the nice things about this, and it might be motivation for this Oklahoma story, is that if you can do that, it allows those oil companies to declare force majeure or to otherwise step away from their contract. Again, if someone is suddenly stopping you from doing business and you can't deliver, um, there's your reason for not uh, having to operate. And of course, too, oil is, it, 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 you know, it, it, it certainly can be waste in the wrong place. It's kind of like a weed as a plant out of place. Well, oil in the wrong place is, is certainly not desirable. Um, and I do know too, just thinking about North Dakota, a lot of oil dependent states, you know, are looking at ways to support the industry, both during the downturn and then especially to keep, uh, keep the possibility that those shut-in wells can be brought in back, be brought in uh, online again sometime in the near future. And again, the, the, the government working relatively closely with the oil industry to ensure its, its viability or relative viability in the near term. And I'll give everybody another second or two to ask your questions, but I think you've all had your chance. Uh, again, if you have any uh, feedback for us, uh, we definitely welcome you to share it. Uh, thank you for your time. I thank the panelists for, for joining us again today. I wish and hope you guys all have a great weekend. Thanks.